Okay, welcome to Physics 350, Class 10. This is on the multipole expansion, which is Chapter 3.4 in the textbook. <coughs> and uh, this is a very interesting technique that allows one allows us to understand the behavior of charge distributions at uh, large distances away. They're do the dominant behavior of charge distributions at long distances away. Um, and that'll make more sense, hopefully, as we go. Um, so let's think about some symmetric arrangements of charges. Um, well, one symmetric arrangement of charge is a point charge, uh, which we've already encountered. You've encountered several times in physics 350 and physics 202. and uh, we call this a monopole field because it's a single pole, one pole in the center. And uh, it should be familiar and straightforward to you. Um, probably you've also seen uh, the field of two opposite, oppositely charged, separated charges, which is called the dipole field, di for two. Negative charge on the left, a positive charge on the right. Um, the field lines go from the positive charge to the negative charge and spiral around in this way, which looks kind of like a spider. So I put a little Spider-Man up here just for fun. Um, a, we can get more complicated fields. This is a, a field of a square of alternating positive and negative charges, which aren't actually pictured here, but here would be a negative charge, here would be a positive charge, here would be a negative, and here would be a positive charge. And you can see the um, 90 degree uh, symmetry, the, the fourfold symmetry of the pattern. And this is called a quadrupole field, okay? And then finally, we can, not finally, but we can go even further. And this is actually a top view of a cube of charges with uh, positive charges being uh, red here and negative charges being blue, uh, viewed from above. And that's called an octopole field. And just to maintain the theme here, I've got uh, Dr. Octopus, Doc Ock, up here in the right corner. Um, anyway, uh, so these are these actually turn out to be very useful. Um, they're they're kind of interesting to look at, um, symmetric. But what's, what's more interesting is we can represent any potential of any arbitrary charge distribution as a sum of these patterns where we weight the, each of these patterns with the right coefficient. Um, this may remind you of the other types of sums that we do, we weight them with coefficients like Taylor series or Fourier series. And there, there is a conceptual similar, similarity there. Um, so let's go back to our, um, to our formula, main formula for the electric potential, which is our uh, constant out in front times one over the separation times the charge density times D and this tau here in, in this uh, video will be um, the volume. Okay, it's also used in the textbook in, in certain places. So d tau is the volume. Um, so we can write this in, in an expansion as uh, a term in uh, 1 over r, which would be the uh, field of a point charge, because a point charge is k kq over r, or 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r, uh, weighted by the appropriate um, strength of that potential, plus uh, a second coefficient, c2, over r squared. It turns out that the potential of the dipole distribution falls off as r squared as we go to far away from it. And the quadrupole would be would fall off as r cubed weighted by its own coefficient and the octopole would fall off as r to the fourth and you can i'm sure you, 
hopefully you can see the pattern here, r, r squared, r cubed, r fourth. So, um, okay, and then, and so on. There's even 16, uh, 16 arrangements of 16 and 32 charges that go as r to the fifth and r to the sixth. So this is the multipole expansion. Um, let's take a, a look at the dipole term um, just uh, to get a flavor for how for how uh, these are treated these terms are treated mathematically. So the dipole term is built from two point charges. So it's got one over four pi epsilon naught times the positive charge over the distance to the positive charge from the positive charge to the uh, point at which we're observing the field or the potential minus, since it's a negative charge, Q over the distance to where we're observing the um, potential again. Okay, so we, we wind up with this sort of system of triangles here where this is at the center of our dipole. This is the positive end, this is the negative end. Our, our actual distance, um, strict distance to the point of observation is r, and the positive end is a little bit closer than the negative end. And it turns out that it's possible to use the law of cosines, okay? Um, if you remember, from, there's the law of sines and the law of cosines to, uh, to solve for or to relate r plus uh, the distance from the positive charge to r and r minus to r. Um, because we have, for example, this triangle here with three sides. One of them is d over two, one of them is uh, r, one of them is r plus. And the law of cosines involves all three sides. Okay, so there's some, um, math, a little bit of mathematics that I've glossed over here, but um, this isn't the pure law of cosines, but with a couple of steps that you can uh, look at in the textbook, we find that one over r plus or minus is equal to one over r times one plus or minus uh, d over two r cosine theta. So just to verify that, um, if cosine theta is positive, so that theta is uh, theta is positive, then um, adding theta would make this side larger, but that would make the uh, r plus in the denominator here have to be smaller, which is in fact what we get up here. We get the positive the positive charge closer to the uh, <coughs> point of observation than the negative charge. Okay, so then um, we can then just uh, algebraically take this expression um, and subtract one over r plus minus one over r minus. It's a little bit of algebra, but when we do it, um, we get uh, d over r squared cosine theta. And then that one over r plus minus one over r minus is a term over here in our potential that we're looking for. So we get V of R is just equal to one over four pi epsilon naught Q times the one over R plus minus one over R minus, which is the um, D cosine theta over R squared, okay? So this is the um, dipole potential term. That's a derivation of the dipole potential term, which we'll come back to later. Um, the full multipole expansion, um, take one, um, we're gonna come at it in two waves, one uh, skipping over some steps and the other going through um, some, some more mathematical details. So again, here's just the idea again, of the monopole, the dipole, the quadrupole, and the octopole. And uh, 
here's our formula for V, uh, our potential, which we're familiar with by now. So in, in doing the multipole, we again use the law of cosines. Um, we're moving from, we're looking at the observation point from the charge to the observation point P, and that's R. And R prime is the, is the vector from, from the um, origin to the source of the charge. And then the separation vector is script R. So they make a triangle with this angle alpha. So we can apply the law of cosines to them. Uh, <clears throat> then let's see, uh, what have we done here? Oh, we've just factored out an R squared, uh, not script R, but an R squared. So that just leaves one divide r prime over r quantity squared uh, and then brings this r down to the denominator now this why have we done that well this term um, r prime over r we assume as i said at the very beginning that the multipole expansion tells us the behavior of a, a group of charge or a, a a density of charge when you're far away from the, fairly far away from the charge. Um, so that means that our vector R, since we're going to be pretty far away from the charge, is going to be a lot bigger in general than our vector R prime, which is somewhere within the charge. So we're a lot farther away from the charge than the extent of the charge. That means R prime over R, R is, is a fairly small number. And if we square it, we get an even smaller number. So this whole, this whole term right here is a small number, which we call epsilon. Um, mathematicians and physicists both use epsilons for small numbers. Okay, so then we have uh, script R squared is R squared times one plus this small number epsilon. We can take the square root of that and get uh, script r is r times square root of one plus epsilon all right and we can make various other approximations that's us in this small parameter epsilon and uh, the end result which i just want to show you now um, and interpret because we're going to go back through one more time um, involved using the small parameter and seeing how it's it actually plays into it so remember, there's a second pass through this. Um, our potential is equal to good old one over four pi epsilon naught times uh, <clears throat> one over R um, times the integral of the uh, charge density over the volume times one over R squared times the integral of the charge density times R prime cosine alpha this is alpha that's the dipole term and then this is the quadrupole term now this may look uh this probably looks rather strange right now but we can see how it comes about um in the next slide oh and i wanted to point out um that the uh this discrete version of the um dipole term which we which we derived for two charges in the previous slide qd cosine theta over r squared looks a lot like we've got the one over r squared but we've got cosine alpha now instead rho dv which is q and and uh, d which corresponds to r prime okay so these two look similar to each other so that gives us confidence that we're on the right track. All right, let's go for the full mathematics. Here again is our um, expression for the potential for R or V. Here is the law of cosines. Here we factor out the R squared. Find the, this is a small term since uh, R prime is less than R. 
and take this expression here with epsilon substituted for this this uh, set of terms and take the square root. Okay, so that's what we did up before. So what's what's the next step in the derivation? Um, well, one over we we um, take the reciprocal because we're interested in one over script R up here. And one over script R is going to be one over R, regular R, times one over the square root of one plus epsilon, which is can be written as one plus epsilon to the minus one half. Okay. Now, here's where we get into uh, Taylor expansions, or Taylor Taylor series. Um, if you haven't heard of, some of you have heard of that probably, and some of you haven't. Um, but Taylor series are very useful when we have um, a quantity which is small, like epsilon here. They allow us to make useful approximations. So the Taylor expansion for one plus epsilon to the minus one half turns out to be um, valid for small epsilon, one minus a half epsilon plus three eighth epsilon squared minus five sixteenths epsilon cubed, and so forth with terms. The terms get smaller and smaller because epsilon is a small number. And as you take more powers of it, small numbers get increasingly small. Um, you can look into the theory of Taylor series to figure out why these coefficients are, are what they are. But for, for now, we'll take that as a given. Um, <clears throat> so now we substitute in for these epsilons. We resubstitute in what we called epsilon, which was this ratio of r prime to r, several ratios of it. So we get one minus a half times this uh, term here. And um, let's see, I've pulled out a, uh, yeah, there's the one over r there, yeah. Uh, I've factored out an r prime over r here but you can figure that out if you look at these two terms, you'll see that they're the same. Just factored out an R prime over R. Then uh, the next term is 3 eighths epsilon squared. That gives us 3 eighths times this whole thing, uh, this whole thing squared, which is what we've got here, <coughs> minus uh, 5 sixteenths epsilon cubed. So here's epsilon cubed. Okay, math getting a little bit hairy. So let's regroup and try to figure out, try to regroup and figure out where we're trying to head. Remember, we're trying to do a multipole expansion. So we want to have the, um, we want to have the terms, each term have, the first term have one over R in it for the uh, monopole term, the second term have one over r squared for the dipole term, third term have one over r cubed for the um, quadrupole term and so forth. So what we do is uh, we factor out an overall one over r and then this would be our monopole term and then our dipole term and then gathering all the terms in this expression, which have uh, r squared in their denominator, that becomes our quadrupole term. Sorry, our uh, yeah quadrupole term. And then here is our octopole term, right here. Okay, so that that brings us back to where we were last time. Um, when we substitute in uh, one over script R in here, that becomes one over regular R, which is outside the integral of the integral of one plus this, plus this, plus this, which gives us this set of terms here. But notice that now we have a series 
where it's in powers of one over r, one over r, one over r squared, one over r cubed. And that's just like the series we had at the beginning where we had c1 over r1, c1 over, sorry, c1 over r, c2 over r squared, c3 over r cubed, and so forth. So we've identified what those coefficients must be. This is c, c1, this is c2, this is c3, and so forth. Okay, so we've we've gone through some fairly heavy mathematics. What is the, um, let's try to not lose the forest for the trees and remember what the purpose of the um, multipole expansion is. Its main advantage is that it can approximate the principal effect of, and any usually first corrections to a charge distribution at long distances. Okay, so if we have uh, like a water molecule um, or a collection of water molecules uh, and we want to know what the, um, we want to know what the electric potential is at some distance away, a large distance relative to the size of the collection of charges, then we can use the multipole expansion. And that happens a lot because particles are very small. So oftentimes we're a lot farther away from them than they are than the size of their internal structure. Okay, so here's just a quick example. Um, here's, here's a water molecule. This is the oxygen, these are the two hydrogen. And uh, it's a neutral overall. Okay. So, um, but you may, you may be familiar with the fact that water has a permanent dipole moment from chemistry or from your general scientific knowledge. So V would be written in the multipole expansion as C1 over R plus C2 over R squared plus C2 over R cubed. Again, far away from the molecule. The, um, Monopole term, since this total amount of charge here is, is neutral, the monopole term will drop out. So C1 will be zero. And then C2, we can, uh, has a certain value, which we, which remember we know how to find now. C2 is, uh, C2 is this right here. If we knew the charge distribution of the water molecule. Anyway, um, and uh, that's going to be, it's going to be principally a dipole moment, but it's not a perfect dipole moment. Uh, a pure dipole moment is just one negative charge above a positive charge. So mixed in with that is a little bit of a quadrupole moment. So C C3 would also be there, but would be much, much smaller than C2. So far away from the water molecule, we can approximate the potential of the um, of the water molecule very well and do calculations with just this number, even though the charge density of the water water molecule is is very complicated. Okay, so that's that's the that's the advantage of the multipole method. Um, and one more thing, um, I want to define the dipole moment for you. Here's our expression for V of R again, which we've started just about every slide. Um, and this is the, the dipole moment. This is the, um, uh, the second uh, term in the multipole expansion. But notice over here that uh, if we look at this triangle, in, if we look at this triangle, uh, R prime, R prime times cosine of alpha is the component of R prime in the direction of, uh, of the vector R. But that's also written as R hat dot R prime. R hat dot R prime is the component of R prime in the direction of R. Okay, so this, this, part in here can be written as r 
hat, where R is our uh, unit vector to, um, heading toward the observation point, dot R prime. So we can replace R prime cosine alpha with R hat dot R prime, but R hat doesn't depend on the variable of integration R prime. So that means we can pull it out in front and we can identify this term right here, which is the term that contains all the primes. That's called the dipole moment of, this, of the distribution, the dipole moment of the distribution. So again, it's just, it's often written as a P, not a, not a row, uh, as R prime, row of R prime, D, DT prime, where this is volume again. And then we can write as shorthand, if we do this calculation once for a given charge distribution, um, we can find the, the uh, electric potential in any direction as just the dipole moment dotted with the, the uh, direction that we're interested in over the distance squared, okay? So the dipole moment is a way to characterize the uh, the second order um, moment of the distribution. And then finally, um, for a discrete version, if we don't have a continuous set of charges, this sum, this integral would, would be replaced by a sum and rho d tau, which is the volume, would be q the charge, so Q sub I, and R prime would become R sub I. So this is the discrete version of the uh, dipole moment. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed learning about the multipole expansion. Um, I realize it's, there were some technical parts to it, but I hope you got the main idea, <clears throat> which is that it allows us to understand the effect of a charge distribution at long distances away um, using just a couple of, uh, of uh, coefficients which we have figured out or, um, how to calculate. All right, thank you very much. See you in class.